the story was submitted to us by Christina Tudor, our friend in Romania. And the story is inspired by traditional Romanian folklore. And it is called The Girl of the Forest. Mm. Once upon a time, there was a young shepherd and his wife. They lived in the mountains at the entrance of a forest. Every morning, the shepherd took the herd on the mountain and returned at sunset. His wife took care of the other animals in the farm and picked herbs with healing properties from the forest. The couple were in love and wanted children, but for a few years they had no luck in their endeavors to start a family. Eventually, in the fourth spring, a child was born, a son. There are no words to describe their happiness. They would have done anything for the new life that they had brought into the world. All their work and efforts now had a new purpose, the well-being of their child. Time went quickly by, and before they knew it, their son had already passed the age of one. It was towards the end of summer. The shepherd was on the mountain with the sheep. The woman was at home. Earlier that day, she had decided to refresh the home and prepare it for, for the arrival of autumn. She had restocked her supply of herbs and was now ready to rearrange everything for the challenging winter months. It was a beautiful day, and since she kept going in and out of the house, she decided to take her son out in the garden put him on a blanket among the flowers, and let him play and enjoy the sun while she was working. Every now and then, she would come by and bring him something to eat, make sure he was all right, simply play with him, or watch him discover the world by himself. Sometime in the afternoon, after a brief errand indoors, the young mother came out to discover that the boy was no longer on the blanket in the garden. Gripped by the chilling sense of fear, she looked around the house, hoping in vain that the child had simply strayed from his place and went not too far. She called him and went into the house, ran to the edge of the forest, and returned. The boy was nowhere to be seen, as if the earth had swallowed him. Then she saw something she had not noticed before. There were footprints on the blanket and around it, leading all the way to the forest. With growing terror, she realized that they were the prints of wolves. Her husband returned as soon as she made this discovery. Crying, she told him what had happened. He immediately took his rifle and went into the woods. He searched the entire night, briefly returned in the morning to eat, then left again. He spent a week in the nearby forest, then started looking for the boy further away in the mountains. Both mother and father kept searching for their son during the following months. In the winter, with heavy hearts, they resigned with the thought that unless animals had killed their boy, the harsh mountain winter certainly did. They grew cold and bitter, their pain too great to allow them to come together again. When spring came, the man took the herd to the sheepfold on the top of the mountain. He rarely returned home. From time to time, his wife brought him food and clothes on the mountain. The time in each other's company was brief and strained by unspoken feelings. And so the years passed. One summer, about ten years after the tragedy, the woman was on her way to the sheepfold to visit her husband. At first, she noticed the wind was growing stronger, then the clouds gathering dark, almost boiling with the rumble of thunder a sign of an approaching storm. She had already covered half the distance towards the mountaintop. As the storm was starting anyway, she decided to keep going. Unlike an ordinary summer storm, this one was cold and violent. She could not see as far as her arm's length, but she kept going. The drops were hitting her like pebbles, and the wind was pushing her around. She felt the scratch of the branches ripping from the trees around her and carried wildly by the currents around her. Suddenly, she heard something different than the noises of the sky and the earth. It was a shriek coming from the forest she had left behind. She knew she was close to the sheepfold now by the shape the path was taking under her feet, yet she felt that there was no time to reach it. She turned, and she saw a beastly figure moving towards her with unimaginable quickness. She froze in terror for a second, then bolted upwards to the wooden shed she could already see through the curtain of the rain. She could hear the breath of the creature behind her, the teeth clattering and the foul smell of its mouth. She suddenly felt a throbbing pain in her arm. She knew that whatever it was, it had gotten hold of her. Then her eyes could no longer see the the rain from in front of her, and she fainted. When she eventually came to, the storm had passed. Only a few drops clung to the leaves, and the wind was quickly scattering the clouds which were stubbornly hanging above the peak. The first thing she felt was pain. Continuous, nauseating, searing pain in her arm. She knew it before she glanced at it, just to make sure. The creature had ripped off her arm. It was now looking, She was now looking at a fleshy stump, gushing with blood. Clinging to her tarnished sleeve, there were long strands of hair. Her own hair. The creature must have grabbed it altogether with her arm. The feeling of dread and lust almost made her faint again. 
but she forced herself to stand up. The shed adjacent to the sheepfold was closer than it had seemed in the pouring rain. Her husband was nowhere in sight. He must be inside resting, she thought. She approached. The door was open. He was indeed lying on the narrow bed. Strange, she said to herself, trying to push away the choking thought that something was wrong. How did he sleep with the door open during this terrible storm? She approached wearily. He seemed asleep in the manner in which he always fell asleep when he was exhausted, face upwards, but none of his usual peaceful snoring. This time his eyes were open, looking at her as if frozen in laughter, his mouth grinning, showing healthy, sharp teeth. Between his teeth, there was something hanging loosely like a piece of cloth. She approached, squinting, but stopped, sharply realizing what she was looking at. The thing she had mistaken for a piece of cloth was a strand of her own hair ripped violently during the storm. She nearly fell off the ground from the shock. He was dead. And he had been dead for days by the look of it. By the, look of it. the creature which had attacked her in the storm was his ghost, trying to keep her away from discovering him. Months passed, and the woman left the house she had shared with her late husband. She moved away from the mountains and the fields of the south, where both the weather and the people were warm. She changed her name and opened an inn at the crossroads. Despite missing her arm, she lacked for nothing. She was working, and life was good. She met travelers who told her stories every day, and she rarely felt lonely. Eight years went by quickly, and one day a young man stepped into the tavern of her inn. He was handsome and had many stories to tell from her travels. She welcomed him as she did all her customers. She gave him food and drink and listened to what he had to say. She rarely spoke of her life to her customers. If they asked anything, she told them a made-up story or brushed off their curiosity regarding her missing arm with a joke. This time, she told him the stories of the mountains and the forest. Nothing untruthful, yet nothing about her own life. He stayed intrigued by the strangeness and beauty of the innkeeper. They soon became lovers, and the young man decided to stay there with the woman and start a family. He ventured into trading and soon became prosperous. She kept the inn, and their way of life was peaceful. A few years passed, and she gave birth to three children. Travelers kept coming to the inn, but none lingered to tell stories as they used to. The woman's evenings belonged now to her family. Hang on one second. Sean's timeout was funny. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Oh, what a timeout. Okay, I can hear y'all again. Cool. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Are you recording this separate as well? I am. Yes. Okay. So you're fine. See, because it doesn't matter now. See? It, yeah. It'll all be good. I keep it'll getting good. error messages. Because you from followed Zoom. the rules. I followed the rules. Thank goodness. Yeah. I keep getting error messages from Zoom. It's like your speaker is not functioning properly. This is not recording. What is the deal? So, okay, here we go. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, continue, right. continue. She's at a crossroads. She better do bad. Oh, this new man, so he's not going to last long. That's yeah, yeah, yeah they, get, they, they get together it's hot. We'll see. All right, cool. Steamy, How old is she at babies. this point? <laughs> there was a 10-year gap and then an eight-year gap. So she's at so 18, least in her, But she could have been pretty young. Late 30s, yeah. We're yeah. going to say late 30s. Yeah, we can say yeah, late fair 30s. Enough, fair enough, fair enough. That's fair. Early yeah. 40s, yeah. Here we go. One night after putting the children to sleep, she stayed in the tavern for a while longer, waiting for her husband, who was unusually late. Mm. He must be very busy this time of year, she thought. It's harvest time, after all, and trade is blooming. As she went, as she was thinking this, the tavern door opened and a stranger came in. He looked rather disheveled, his clothes worse for wear. I'm afraid the tavern is closed, said the innkeeper, (laughs) eager to keep... Eager to rest as soon as her husband returned, and not prone to acts of charity for someone who looked like a beggar. I've traveled a long way, the man said, with a voice which stopped the woman in her tracks. I am tired and I crave a warm meal. Would you please be so kind as to offer me a place by the hearth and a bowl of soup? Strange as it was, the woman found it impossible to refuse him. Something about him, she didn't know what, told her it was of utmost importance to hear what he had to say. So she brought him soup, bread, and a strong tea. She sat across from him at the table, watching him eat. I don't have money to pay for tonight's food and shelter, he said. I know, she replied. He nodded. I have news and old stories of you and your own. The woman kept silent, but her eyes nudged him to speak. You lost a child, a man, and your arm in the mountains. Don't worry, he said, seeing the panicked flicker in her eyes. No one around here knows that. I do, because... 
and he paused, trying and then giving up on finding the proper way to say it. I simply know such things. The woman straightened in her seat. She felt a lump in her throat, a feeling of anxiety. She kept listening. The young man you married, did he tell you where he's from? He's traveled far and back again, the stranger said, looking into his teacup. He's not from here, the woman replied. Oh, no, he isn't, echoed the ragged man. When he was a boy, he found somewhere down at the edge of the chain of... When he was a boy, he was found somewhere down at the edge of the chain of mountains. Oh, no! Where's the baby? He was found in a place known for naturally sheltering packs of wolves during the harsh winter months. They must have taken him as one of their own. The woman was hearing his words muffled as if they were coming to her through very heavy winds. Her body... Aren't you sure it's her? (laughs) He cannot be, she thought. We looked everywhere, and then he was on the other side of the province. They couldn't have... Oh, dear, the ragged stranger said, warmly replying to her thoughts. He's younger than you, isn't he? Ah! It doesn't show. Sorry. You're a beautiful, healthy woman. But he is, oh my gosh. and you know it. Her face was still as a stone. The only movement on her pale complexion was the flicker of the last flames of the hearth, reflected in tears, silently covering her cheeks. What do I do now? She whispered after what seemed to be an eternity. I've only told you the old stories, my dear, said the man. I believe you should hear the news. Her tired eyes looked at him, bearing the refusal her lips were not able to utter. He ignored it. Your young husband is dead, he said plainly. He lies killed not far from the crossroads. The money he earned was from this season's the money he earned from this season's trades made him an easy target for the band of thieves who did it. Why, she said through sobs, why did he have to tell me? Why do you who who do you think you are? Get out. The man looked at her, then, without getting up, looked towards the door of the tavern. It was wide open. You had to know, he said. Then he nodded and closed his eyes, exhausted. She gazed at the door, then got up and walked out into the night. She could see the road where the young man had been murdered. Then, without hesitation, she ran and threw herself into the deep stone well in front of the gate. She was real. As real as when she was alive, only now it was better. Her arm was in its place as if the attack on the mountain had never happened. The white hairs near her temples had disappeared and her black mane shone on her shoulders as it used to be when she was a girl. Her skin had changed too. It was softer, no longer bearing the marks of time, work, pain, childbearing, and worry. She was whole as she had not been for many, many years. But she was not alive. Or at least the people in the village thought she wasn't. For about five years she had been in the forest near the lake. She loved swimming at night. For some reason, that's when she really thrived. Daylight was somewhat painful for her new body, and she couldn't really be as perceptive as during the night. She wasn't bothered by it. She didn't want to do anything or meet anyone anyway. The young man she liked only visited her at night when she was at her best. All the men she had met since her change came at night. Some were simply lost, unknowing, scared. They were the easiest to love. She simply soothed them, casting their fears away. She usually took them for a swim in the moonlight, and they simply fell asleep in her arms like little children. Others came looking for her during exciting... Others came looking for her, daring, excited, burning with anticipation. When they were like this, they usually forgot their manners. Then she had to remind them to behave with a quick slap which pinned them against a tree, making them beg and sob like children. But she was a forgiving creature and soon took them for a swim too. Now they were all peaceful and asleep at the bottom of the lake, just like her three angel babies. So good they were asleep when that nasty man came to tell me those horrible stories, she thought. When you're asleep, nothing can hurt you. The third kind were just so amusing. They came prepared with knives, rope, and garlic, and embers, and other ridiculous charms, as if ready for some ancient battle. They sat for a while on the shore of the lake, baring their teeth like dogs, while she she was finishing her evening swim. Then she only had to get out of the water, take those useless toys from their hands, invite them for a swim, and put them to sleep too. The most recent one, the one she liked, was different. And that was because she couldn't see him, and he couldn't see her either. She knew he couldn't because if he had been able to see her, he would have come for a swim a long time ago. But she was patient. 
You'll either lose your mind or you'll die. So don't even think of it, lad, said his older brother and his mother and his auntie and granny and other people in the village. Some were crossing themselves. Others were grabbing the collar of their blouses, marking three spits towards their own chest without actually spitting, just mechanically flicking the tip of their tongue against the upper lip. Christian and pagan gestures, all done in the same hurried, secretive manner. There were many names for girls like her. The ladies, themselves or herself, the girls of the forest, the she-masters, and so on. And one of them was living in the woods. Well, not really alive, but nevertheless existing. In a quite distressing manner, judging by the number of young men who had disappeared lately. Yes, she had been alive, the owner of the burnt inn. Then she killed herself when she found out her young husband was actually her son. The inn burned to the ground that same night. Then somehow she turned into a girl of the forest and became younger and more beautiful. Not that anyone had ever returned to tell what she actually looked like. But he wanted to see for himself. Better yet, catch her and show her to everyone. He prepared himself for weeks. He slowly but surely trained himself, numbed himself to the silvery sound of her voice at night. The first time he heard it, he thought he was mad. He actually had to tie himself to the bark of a tree and bite hard into a piece of leather he had prepared. Otherwise, he probably would have run straight into her arms and... And what had everybody said? Lose your mind or die? Right. No. That wasn't an option. So bite on that piece of leather and stay put, no matter how enchanting that cursed voice might be, he told himself. And so evening after evening, he managed to get closer and closer, approaching the lake, approaching her. After a while, he felt that he was getting to know her and her thoughts by the tones of her voice. Some nights she was playful and inviting. Other no nights story. she was almost angry, upset. The most difficult nights were those in which he could sense her loneliness and grief. In those moments, he wanted to untie himself, run to the lake, take her in his arms and love her until he felt that he had drained all the sorrow in her, leaving only the sweetness and warmth of her true feelings. Because despite the words uttered in the village and the pain she had lived, he knew that she had light within herself. It was a warm night. The reflection of the moon in the lake felt clean like silver. He had never been so close to actually see the lake in the moonlight. The rope dug heavily into the flesh of his chest, but he knew that it was the only way he could protect himself. I know you're there, she said, so close that he forgot to breathe. I've been listening to you for a while now. Silence. His ears were ringing and he felt that he could feel his heart, that he could spit out his heart in any second. That's how strongly it beat in his chest. Why don't you come on on the shore? The water rippled around her hips and he could hear it. You know that I could just come around that willow you've tied yourself to and show myself to you? It would be so easy. She carelessly splashed a circle of water around herself. A few drops landed on his neck. He felt nauseated. But you've put so much effort into coming here. I would never dream of ruining that. So I shall speak to you until you decide to face me. Who knows? Maybe you'll even join me for a swim before sunrise. I get so tired after sunrise. That was it. If he could make it until sunrise, then that was his chance of catching her at her weakest. What's your name? She asked suddenly. The question came so naturally it startled him. He had to bite his tongue in order to keep quiet. It's not fair, you know, she said as if reading his mind. You've been listening to my voice like a thief and haven't even given me the chance to hear yours. Some might say you're a bit rude. Then silence fell. A silence which scared him because it could mean several things. First, she could observe him unseen and unheard, which was dangerous. But no, she couldn't because she promised him she would wait for him to show himself first. Then there was the other explanation for the silence. The scariest one of all. It was that, an all, is that it was all in his head. The girl, the voice, the water splashing so close to him, his feelings. And if it was all in his imagination, then why had he tied himself to a tree like an idiot? His hand reached... Uh, reached around the sturdy knot that he had tied to himself so thoroughly in the evening, when the air around him had become heavy and collapsed in a whisper close to his ear as if she had heard all of his thoughts. There are some things I know about you, though, she said, things that not many people from the village could claim to know. For example, I know how you breathe when you're deep in thought, how your heart seems to beat slower, 
I can hear them. I don't need to know your name because I know you. Just like I know that you now will untie that knot, allow yourself to breathe properly once or twice, then you will turn towards me. With growing terror, he slowly started turning. He tried to resist, but she seems to be able to control every single fiber in his body by just being. Then, just before he faced her, he closed his eyes and heard it. The crystalline thrill of the morning lark. He yanked himself to face away from the lake and looked towards the sky. The shepherd's star was fading and the pale rosy light of the morning was visible through the branches. He knew it was the best time to face her. He quickly untied the rope around himself and suddenly turned towards her. Finally, she said, smiling. Her charm was still strong, but not as powerful as before. He could stand up and look at her without feeling like throwing himself at her feet. Why don't you come closer, she asked, gesturing towards the water. No, he replied, then asked her, then added hurriedly, thank you. She smiled, blushing like a rose, then suddenly threw herself towards his face, nails ready to claw his cheek. He only had time to duck, then, like a bull, she ran towards, uh, then like a bull ran towards her, throwing her and himself to the ground. She was gasping for air and her nails dug into the flesh on his shoulder. He struggled to get a good grip on her arms to stop her attack by pinning them above her head. When she did, she stopped struggling, looked into his eyes and smiled sweetly. Time seemed to stop and he felt his willpower melting like wax and dark pool in the dark pools of that gaze. Then, without any sign of warning, she hit him in the stomach. He fell back, crouching and trying in vain to get a hold of his own breath. Now you know how it feels, she hissed. And giving him no time to recover, grabbed him by the shoulders and plucked him up like he weighed nothing. Back on his feet, he noticed that she hadn't just lifted him up, but she had plunged him ankle deep into the soil of the forest. Just like the old stories, she challenged. Your turn. I don't want to hurt you, he said. I just don't want you to kill me. Then you'll have to kill me, she replied with a sad smile. I can never stop. Yes, you can, he said, tentatively reaching his hand towards her. She stretched out her own hand, gently stroking his fingers. Both of them shivered. He smiled. She softly tightened her grip on his hand, and he stepped towards her. She put both hands on his hips in the beginning, as in the beginning of an embrace, but her grip became tighter and she lifted him again with unimaginable swiftness and strength. She threw him into the ground. This time he was plunged knee deep in the soil. Fight me, she screamed, fury and agony fighting in her voice. He reacted instantly, grabbing her by the waist and plunging her into the soil all the way down to her hips. Before she got time to move, he took the rope and tied her so tight that she could only just breathe. He then carried her in his arms all the way to his house in the village. The sun was a long way up in the sky, and he was exhausted. Once he stepped into the gentle shade of the garden, a heavy feeling of slumber dragged him to the ground under the branches of a walnut tree. With his last strength, he loosened the tightness of the rope around her and gently laid her down next to himself. She was peacefully asleep. Smiling, he fell asleep too. When he awoke, the sun was almost fading behind the hills and a soft, chilling breeze made his skin ripple. He still held her hand in his own. Hers was cold. He looked at her face. Her eyes were fixed on him in a sweet, peaceful smile. She was dead. Wild. Wow. <laughs> is she like a, an episode? That's like a damn episode wow. of The Witcher. The end? Yeah. For real. Is she a, like a Rusulka or something like that? Like, what is she supposed to be? Because it was like, at first it's like, okay, there's vampire vibes. But then she's with the water and like luring men. So I was like, I think, uh, isn't that like a Rusulka? And I don't know. Whatever. I'll have to ask there's Christina. Of, yeah. 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 What exactly she is. Yeah. But like. Sean, the only reason I was shushing you, by the way, <laughs> is because this is a story that Christina went out of her way to like make good. So we should try to show it a little bit of respect. <laughs> hey, all I'm saying is I wasn't the only one audibly Reaction. reacting. <laughs> and so I was the only one that got I mean, shushed, audience you know responses. Saying, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I'm like, we can get the nice clean experience. version of the story however, on the podcast. However, I yeah, I was gonna say, we can't get a yeah. clean version if we make Kara laugh though. That's why I was also like, let's try to let Kara get through the thing so it can be yeah I think I did I think I did no you did you did you did a great job despite all yeah you did great I can do another audio Uh, recording of it too yeah if you send it to me I'll edit the audio version okay 
and I'll add, I'll put some. I can do a clean version too, like properly. Music under it. What? That was a yeah. legit story. That doesn't seem as no. long as you as it seems. No, it was yeah. great. Lots yeah. of lots of twists and twists. It's like and multi, turns. like multi generation. I also was kind of like, shut yeah. the fuck up. I want to hear the story. I don't want to <laughs> hear also, what you have to say. Like, I want to hear the damn story. It's very Sean, like, when we Oedipus watch a scary Rex. movie, we'll be together yeah. being like, oh Anna. <laughs> I was like, I, I found my roll dog and then talking to the TV. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, sitting here, I'm sitting here like shut up gonna, I'm in the middle of a good episode we're gonna drive you talking. insane David oh yeah every night. sorry oh, man. maybe <laughs> this is why I get too scared during horror movies is I get too because you're like too sucked in I'm like yeah. yeah tell me more no it was great it was really yeah. I liked all the like like yeah it is multi-layered like, yeah. layers yeah. of different like t- like one story than another yep. than yeah. another but like i'm gonna have to listen to fun. it again because i missed the part where not that i missed the part but somehow when she threw herself in the well and then she like regenerated to this right that's like, I think wait, she became like, like a, a vampire or whatever it that was vampire was the, the, the the girl's the, forest. whatever spirit yeah. Yeah. creature yeah and that i think the well makes sense and she because, had already like, been she died bitten. in the well she died yeah, in the she well already, and she had she been already... bitten by the ghost of her husband who was apparently oh my Some like fish. a werewolf Some kind of creature. That, that he had teeth yeah. he had teeth and fangs so, it would go off for a while so yeah. yeah but then she died in the well and she died in water and then she was luring people to go to, to water the water. water right so like oh my goodness it's like a I reincarnation think, by water into a little yeah thing. yeah or just her, oh, again a dear. spirit that was so distressed that it turned her into a monster why her yeah. husband was the creepy monster already i don't know but yeah he was up there so, with the wolves maybe he was up there the with wolves, the wolves all the took time the, that took yeah the child. took the child so and... right so then the kid that was found years ago that was her son that yep. you're referring yep. to in the yeah, story right okay that's what i thought yep. yeah Oh, yeah, what that's what I read. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, yeah. I was like, wait, time out. I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. That was good. That was like that. Oh, that was a great Thanks, one, Christina. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Christina, yeah, yeah, yeah. always coming yeah. strong Heck with yes. the story and folklore. Interview with the playwright, a short play by John Maybe, our wonderful submitter to our thing. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> yes, I took the back. So, oh. character, should I just say the character yeah, names? Yeah, do the characters. Okay. Yeah, do Claire, it, do all so, of them. so in characters, we have Clara. Cold Reed. That's also what's yeah, scary about this. Dream <laughs> long right. pause there, Sean. Really, really <laughs> you are done. Suspenseful, a pregnant pause. <laughs> uh, so we have Clara, female, any age. And then we have Micah, male. Micah. The location is Micah interviews Clara in her scheduled home. Secluded. Secluded. Oh my gosh. Try again, buddy. Oh, dear God. Oh, God. This is a cold read. I was like, oh, it's not going to be as frigid. Frigid reading. Here we go. I'm going to edit the hell out of this one. Okay, let me also push for Not the video, but yeah, you can edit the audio. Here we go. Let's try this again. Here we go. Let's start it from the top. (laughs) Interview with the playwright. A short play by John Maybe. Characters. Clara, female, and Micah, male. Location. Micah interviews Clara in her secluded home. Synopsis. Gifts come in all shapes and sizes, but some are eternal. Sean's gonna edit out that he fucked everything up, but. <laughs> yep. Yes, I took the back roads. And you weren't followed. I doubt anybody could follow. I almost missed the tiny road, though. Pretty dark out here. Drove real slow, worried I'd run into a trick or treater. Unlikely. There are no other homes this far out of town, and no one walks this late at night, even on Halloween. It's dangerous. I left my cell phone at home, too, like you asked. You must think I'm paranoid. No, I mean, no. I doubt you've ever interviewed someone this discreetly. Sometimes you need to take precautions. Someone as famous as yourself. Are playwrights ever famous? You are. There's a thin line between famous and infamous. I suppose what's unknown is also what's mysterious. The more I live in the shadows, the more I'm sought. I love being unknown. I mean, no one really pays much attention to me in general. Freelance writer for a nothing paper really doesn't make headlines, literally. Sorry for the pun. I think it's charming. You're charming. 
Most people would have balked at the idea of meeting me in the dead of night, having to lie about their whereabouts. Well, there really wasn't anyone for me to lie to, actually. No one at all? Just my editor. But once he finds out I've landed this interview, then... No one ever likes to feel landed. I meant that in a good way. Honestly, after all our phone calls, I never thought you'd agree to actually meet. I always ended up talking more to y- more than you did. Not good for an interviewer. <sighs> That's why I invited you here. I enjoyed our talks. I felt... enjoyment. Don't you usually enjoy things? Not in a long time, Micah. But what about writing? Writing brings more release than enjoyment. It's something I'm compelled to do. It's enjoyable for me, your writing. There's something about the fantastical characters you create and... I don't write fantasy. Immortal beings, vicious and supernatural creatures feeding on the living. Once you let go of the idea of heroes and villains, you're finally left with everything in between. A nightmare is just a dream set apart, and setting yourself apart from the world gives the most beautiful perspective. And that's why you live alone. Perhaps that's why you live alone, too. I feel like I'm the one being interviewed again. And yet you still came tonight. On All Hallows' Eve, nonetheless. Careful, if you bite your lip harder, it'll split open. Sorry, it's just something I do. When you're nervous? No. Well, maybe. And your hands, just look at them clasped together so tight, such a deep red, they're pulsating. You notice a lot. I'm an observer. That's how I survive. And what else are you observing about me? Only that you haven't touched any of the refreshments. I want you to enjoy yourself tonight. I've never been fed at an interview before, especially steak. Unconventional, perhaps, but healthy. Iron fortifies the blood. Aren't you eating too? I've recently fed. You're so pale. Have I said something wrong? I'm sorry, Miss, um... I insist you call me Claire. Claire, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm not feeling well. Maybe I should just... It's natural, you know. As in, from nature. The emotion you're feeling right now. I'm not feeling anything in particular. I'm fine. Micah. I'm, I'm not scared. The hairs on your arms are at full attention. Animals have the same instinct, a sense that something is subjectively wrong, when objectively... The opposite is true. I'll never understand when humans speak of merely trusting their gut, because it's an awareness that actually engages the entire body. It's at the core of survival. I'm not scared. There it is again. That crack in your voice. Why am I really here? Why'd you invite me, Clara? When I was younger, my favorite activity was doing nothing at all. At least it seemed like nothing to others. I'd simply sit in a crowded tavern at night, watching observing. And within minutes, I'd understand everything and everyone around me, their alliances, their quarrels, their desires. It was easy to make my selections. Those who either wouldn't be missed or who deserved to be missed. Eventually, I'd escape to a new village because I became too well known, an endless cycle in endless cities throughout the world. I don't understand. I believe you do. I've always enjoyed the written word, but there were lifetimes I didn't write anything at all protecting my anonymity. And for reasons I can't explain, here, now, in this place, I was filled with an overwhelming desire to be known, after centuries of the opposite. (laughs) Funny, isn't it? How we all act against our own self-interests at times, fulfilling needs that might, in turn, betray us. Unlock this door. It's a push-pull contradiction. The desire to be known and the desire to be free, the two rarely coexist. That's why All Hallows' Eve is my favorite holiday. The act of disguising oneself in order to be seen. What if you had the time, Micah? All the time in the world to go and grow into anything you imagined. A gift. Please, let me go. There. There. I've unlocked the door. I can leave? Of course you can. You'll just try and stop me. Do you want me to? I wish I could describe the scent. Fear. It's intoxicating. Not an odor or even a particular fragrance, but something else. Something ancient. 
I wonder if it's the way I once smelled. It's been a long time since I felt it. Almost entertaining now. Please, don't think me unkind. I take no pleasure in one's displeasure, especially not in yours, Micah. That's why I write. As to not lose all memory of those emotions completely and become something else permanently. Perhaps that's my own fear. Can you smell it on me, too? Stop. Don't come any closer. I said you may leave if you wish. I will not interfere. I don't believe you. That's probably wise. I don't want this. I don't want any of this. Tell me what you do want. What was it like for you? It's been so long. I couldn't recall, even if I desired. You must remember something about yourself from before. Memories recreate themselves and degrade every instance they're recalled to the surface. By now, it's all just dust. And isn't that torture? To lose your history, your sense of who you were. It can also be a blessing. This thing, whatever you want to call it, can't be a gift if I don't choose it. Does one choose to become a great painter? Choose to become a great athlete? Choose to become a great poet? The most important gifts are bestowed upon us, not chosen. And if you could have chosen this kind of life? Well, that's irrelevant. Or it's the most important thing to ask. Micah, it's impossible to try and explain the type of connection you'll feel to everything around you. To literally feel the grass growing beneath your feet, the wind miles above your head. You'll be connected to everything. I'd still feel as lonely as I do right now. Of course you won't. Then why do you? Go. I mean it. And publish what you will. I'll be gone anyway. You'd get tired of me. Of course I would. You're not the first. What happened to the rest? They're off. Everywhere and nowhere. So many. What humans don't know is that every relationship ends in a goodbye, even when you have all the time in the world. Do you still love them? And what exactly is love? For the Greeks, it's the face that launched a thousand ships. For the English, it's what made two star-crossed lovers defy the feud between their families. It's what every song and play and book and film attempts to wrestle. There's never an answer, yet we keep asking over and over. Don't you ever get tired? It's the questions that make everything worthwhile. I'll stay. Are you sure? No. I remember now. Lost after a millennia. But not quite dust after all. When poised with that identical question, my answer was the same. I really like that this ends with a gasp. A gasp. <laughs> a gasp. But what is, is the gasp? Is the, is the gasp she bites? She bites him, right? I it mean, just says a gasp. it just says a gasp. So it's up to you. I think that's if it were to be staged, it could can be. You do your, it's can you do your gasp one more time? Because it was like gasp, and then you started talking. I mean, I gasped and I left a pretty good amount of time, but sure. There wasn't a, there wasn't a big chunk of time. Yeah. Just do it one more time. You couldn't hear it because Zoom is bad. <laughs> Do it one more time. One more time. I did. Oh dang! Zoom is bad, Sean. I'm I'm looking at my <laughs> recording da- on Audacity. Audacity. I'll do a third one. Ready? Here yeah. you go. Sweet. This is why we record both <laughs> ways, Anna and Sean. That make you feel better, Sean, that I called out Anna too. There you go. I, so I mean, I knew I should have done it. I just... did. You, did you record separate for this one? I did. I've been recording. Was I supposed to record? Good. No. Ah, just kidding. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. Love it. Of we course did. I did. That is a cold says. read, considering we knew nothing about this. <laughs> We did. I like we it. did a good job. We snuck hey. it in there. And it was good pacing too. We yeah. snuck it in there, man. It was nice. Hey, nice. nice.